Welcome to the Propreneur Podcast, where we help practice owners become better entrepreneurs. I'm your host, Dino Watt. And welcome once again, everybody, to the Propreneur Podcast. Excited to have you here again for another day of best practices to share with you on how you can really scale and grow your practice. Today is an awesome day because I've been actually waiting to have this podcast for a while. I've seen our guest speak a few times. I have listened to a couple of his podcasts, other podcasts he's been on, and I just find it fascinating because as you know, as if you listen to this podcast for any amount of time, I love to research human behavior and what makes people tick. And this is a very uh, specialized way of thinking about people tick. Before we get into that, remember, thank you. I just wanted to say thank you again to everybody for sharing this podcast and subscribing it to your friends and colleagues. We are one of the fastest growing podcasts in the ortho and dental space, and I'm super excited about that and grateful to all of you for listening and participating and sending in your words of gratitude to us. So thank you so much for doing so. Today, our guest is none other, none other than David Harris, who is, as he says, has the coolest job in dentistry because he gets to chase and catch those who steal from dentists. So if you are driving your car, I'm going to suggest that you actually quickly either get home, pause this, get home and listen to it while you're sitting because you need to take notes. I am not a dentist. I'm not an orthodontist. And like I said, I've listened to David a few times in his lectures and I take notes so that I can share them with my clients because I know they're not thinking about the things that David is. So, David, it is an honor and a privilege to have you on the show today. Welcome. Thank you, Dino. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm excited because I know I'm in the big leagues when I'm in, on your podcast. Oh, that's very kind of you. Well, l- listen, uh, the fact of the matter is, is that unfortunately, you deal with what people don't want to think about or want to believe is actually happening. People love to live in this space of, well, that's happening over there. You know, I know my girls or I know my team and they live in this fantasy world. And unfortunately, you have way too much experience to know that not all fantasies are true. Some of them become like Fantasy Island, right, where it becomes danger or the worst, (laughs) the, the nightmare scenario. Before we get into all that you do, one of the things that we do on this podcast is we, we believe that stories connect all of us. So can you tell us your story of how you got into doing what you're doing now? Yeah, and um, I guess I would like to say that I had a great business plan and I saw an opportunity and I went at it and, and it turned out to be successful. Um, the truth is a little more accidental than that. Okay. Um, I was uh, not much of, a, of, of an achiever in high school. In fact, uh, the school, uh, when I was uh, partway through my, my junior year, uh, called my parents and uh, suggested that maybe it was time for the school and David to stop wasting each other's time. Wow. Uh, so I, I suddenly had lots of time on my hands. <laughs> and um, people who are, who are 15 years old, almost 16 years old, and have time on their hands tend not to use it well. And that was me. So uh, the, 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 the police were starting to show up at my parents' house with some frequency. Wow. And um, finally, I got put in front of a judge. And the judge looked at me and said, Mr. Harris, I'm going to give you a choice. Your choice is green or orange. And I said, what are you talking about? He said, well, I'm, I'm giving you a choice. Green is the color the army wears and orange is what you'd be wearing in prison. Oh, wow. And I didn't have to think about it for long. I said, green sounds good. Yeah, it sounds great. And away I went. Um, the, uh, the, and, and just to put this into context, this was sort of right after the end of the Vietnam War and uh, wearing a uniform was not something that a lot of people wanted to do then. Mm-hmm. So the military was having trouble making its quotas and there I was. Yeah. And you know, Dino, for the first time in my life, I felt like I belonged somewhere. Nice. Um, the military was the, the army was the, one of the most positive things that ever happened in my life. And I really prospered there and, and um, ended up getting both an undergraduate and a graduate degree, which isn't a bad accomplishment for a guy without a high school diploma. Um, yeah. And, um, you know, I, I, I began to believe in myself. And eventually I left the army. I went to work for a bank. I, I only lasted a couple of years there and they, they just drove me crazy. I mean, they had this propensity to make the same mistake over and over again. 
Um, so I, I was an investigator there and I just, I just saw the repeated mistakes and one day I quit. So I was sitting at home and, and really trying hard to postpone thinking about what I was going to do next when the phone rang. And it was a guy who had been in high school with me for my brief visit there, who was now a dentist. And he said to me, I think my front desk person's stealing from me and I really have no one else to call. Uh, the guy caught me at the right time. This was August of 1989. And this is before there were, were video recorders and there was nothing good on TV. <laughs> and I said, no problem. I'll meet you tonight at your practice after it closes and we'll get to the bottom of it, of what's going on. So I went to his practice and, and saw what she was doing fairly quickly. I mean, this was before practices computerized, the old pegboard system that um, some, of the, some of the older listeners to your podcast might, might remember fondly. Know. And um, so I, I, I saw what she was doing. My friend asked me to come back in the next morning to help him fire this woman because he really didn't feel like facing that by himself. So I did. And I walked away from that. He promised to buy me dinner that I'm still waiting for. <laughs> um, and, you know, I thought, well, that was interesting, but I didn't really see a career for myself. Right. Well, two weeks later, lightning kind of struck. I was going into my own dentist's office for an appointment. And imagine what ran through my mind. I had my hand on his front door and I was about to go in. And I looked through the glass panel in the door and I saw sitting at his front desk. No way. The same woman I helped fire two weeks ago. No way. That isn't quite what I said. Wow, that is crazy. That isn't what I said either. What I said wouldn't be repeated <laughs> in polite company. So I ran to a payphone. I, I called the practice. I didn't know a whole lot about how dental offices worked then, but I did know the name of a local orthodontist, so I just used it uh, and got, the, got my dentist on the phone. And uh, when he picked up, I said, it's not Dr. Jensen, it's David Harris. I'm the guy who's supposed to be in your chair right now. Let me explain why I'm not. And I told him about the bag of tricks that he had sitting at his front desk. And he asked me in a panicked voice what he should do next. And about two sentences later, he hired me. And wow. by the time I finished his work, the local Henry Shine rep realized what I was doing and had a couple of other clients who had embezzlement issues. And all of a sudden, I was in business. That I mean, is awesome. No plan. I, I didn't have a name for my company. Um, you know, nothing. And, and yeah, that's how it started. So when you went to school, though, you went to school for this investigative type. I don't even know what it is. Like, what, what, how, did um, you, how do you decide, hey, I want to start investi investigating in banks and helping them? Well, uh, when I was in the Army, they, they quickly realized my talent. And my talent was breaking into houses. Oh, cool. Uh, yeah. So <laughs> um, what I would do on, on, on military posts was break into secure areas as a way of exposing the weaknesses in the security. Oh, interesting. Um, and, you know, I, 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 and, and, you know, that's not kind of a full-time gig. So you do that some of the time and the rest of the yeah. time, normally I was doing investigations. Um, you know, so if, if, if rifles went missing somewhere, you know, I was one of the guys who'd try to find out where they went. Um, and uh, when, when the army sent me to school, I, I ended up, my, my undergrad is in accounting. Um, my master's degree is in applied mathematics. Um, so statistics, probability, stuff like that. Right. Uh, which, which I don't use in its pure form very often, but um, and then I, I went on and did a CPA and I, I'm what's called a certified fraud examiner. I also have a forensic CPA certification. Um, so I've, I've, I've got uh, uh, a reasonable number of, of post-nominals now, but um, yeah, I, I, wow. I, I started out pretty low in the education spectrum. Well, but being able, I love that you were able to find, you know, it's funny, I, I say awesome when you say I, my talent was breaking houses because when you think about it, like it's a, it's a cool ability to do, like not for a bad reason, but to know that you have that skill set, you figure things out. You're able to see a problem in front of you and figure your way around it. I, I, I actually think that is such an amazing talent. So when my neighbors lock themselves out of their houses, I mean, they come over and knock on my door and say, can you get me in? Right. Sure. 
I don't know why I have that. I have an image of that kid on Back to the Future who was in the cage and, you know, the, that uncle who was like, hey, get used to those bars, you know. <laughs> you know, from a little kid, you're always sneaking out of places. Well, that's awesome. Okay, so now you're taking this skill set that you didn't know you were going to be able to apply into the dentist dental world. You now create a business around it. And now here you are 30 years later. Is that correct? 31. 31. So now you're the CEO. You finally did figure out a name for it, Prosperdent. And you're able to now really kind of corner the market in this space. Was finding out about embezzlement and fraud from from that perspective a big deal back then? Like, were there other people doing this or? Um, there have always been other people doing this, but most of them I would categorize as, as well-intentioned amateurs. Okay. Uh, so, you know, sometimes if a, if a doctor mm -hmm. has embezzlement concerns, they'll go to their CPA, which is kind of like me going to you and pointing at this tooth and saying, Dino, do you think I need a root canal? Right, right. Uh, you know, so the, the thing about accounting for dentistry that makes it different than pretty much every other kind of accounting is that dental accounting is split between two pieces of software. So most dentists, and, and, and I know a, a lot of your community orthodontists, the, the, this part's really identical for them. Everybody uses practice management software to track revenue. And then they have some kind of accounting software, like maybe QuickBooks to track expenses. And those two really don't talk to each other. Hmm. Um, when accountants do the, a dentist's work, normally they don't even look at the practice management software because they don't need to to do their work. They can do it all from the bank account and, right. and the checkbook, basically. So, you know, practice management software is a very, very foreign country to them. And that's typically where the bodies are buried when embezzlement is happening. Because they're hiding some of those numbers inside of the software that's never going to be looked at besides... Well, yeah. never, never by the accountant. Right, um, right. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, the, the accounting process for dentists really kind of totally bypasses practice management software. And so when you call your accountant and you say, I, I think somebody's stealing from me, what they're going to do is they're going to look at what they know. And what they know is really the expense side. Right. So, you know, they'll have a look at your payroll to see if somebody's padding that. And they might be, but you know, there's a very limited amount of money that you can steal with payroll. There's an almost unlimited amount you can steal um, by pocketing revenue. And that's, that's the way that most stealing happens in dentistry. Okay. You say an unlimited amount of, of being able to pocket through revenue. You know, I know there's doctors right now just being like, but I, I look at this and I look at these books and stuff like, like what is, What's the most extreme you've ever seen? Let's go there first. Because what I want to do is I want to get in, and I, I think it's important to say this. We talked about this a little off air. Like, just so the doctors know, we're not going to go into methodology. We're not going to talk about, like, how they did what they did because it just makes sense. We're on a podcast. Anybody can listen to this. We're not trying to teach people how to steal from you. What we want is we want you as the doctors to recognize some of the signs that would have you calling David, right? To be like, this is what we need you to, and like, uh, that, this is a red flag. And, and by the way, I, so there's two questions here. I want to know about the most egregious one that you've ever seen, uh, but also um, the dangers of doctors thinking they can figure this out themselves. Yeah. Because I know we're dealing with an audience, you know, all you doctors out there, you're awesome at being able to solve problems. That's what your job is, is literally to figure it out. And I think sometimes that gets in the way of us really being able to have a professional come in and who somebody is, that is their job to do and let them really dig deeper into that process. So let's go to my first question first. What's the most egregious you've ever seen? Cause you know, I like to read the end of the book before we get okay. to the, we read the whole thing. Um, biggest I've ever seen was about $2.1 million. From one person? Over about a six-year period. One person was embezzling six, $2.6 million. 2.1 over, over six years. Over six years. Okay. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. That's, that's, a, that's like a, 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 when you break that down, that's a yearly income. Like, 
they're literally embezzling their uh, on on top of their norm. I'm just shocked. Like that's a crazy amount of money. Yeah, it's you know three hundred and fifty thousand a year. Um, we have we have this part of our website, Dino, called the Hall of Shame, and that's where we profile <laughs> embezzlers. That's awesome. And one one uh, one one category that we have in the Hall of Shame is called the Million Dollar Club. And these are people who have stolen more than a million dollars from their doctor. I believe we have nine of them currently. All right, David. Now, come on. Like, who's not going to notice a million dollars being missing out of their business? Well, apparently these nine dentists. Wow. Um, that's but, crazy. Um, yeah. Um, you know, it, it, embezzlers are pretty good at finding the pain point. At, you know, stealing up to the level where it starts to get noticed, but not crossing that line. You know, that kind of brings in though, a little bit of a, I just thought of this as I was saying, that's crazy. You know, who doesn't notice that? Is that part of the problem though, is the shame of like realizing that you didn't catch it? Like that's embarrassing, I bet for some people when, when, uh, when you are to point that out. A lot of people feel that way and I'm not sure it's justified. Um, yeah. I, I, I've got to tell you, you know, I, I, I've met very few dentists who I would consider to be anything less than pretty gifted intellectually. I mean, let, let's agree that yeah, they're, right. they're a totally. smart group of people Absolutely. To, to get to where they are. Um, a lot of the people who steal are far less educated and probably less intelligent. Um, and yet what I tell dentists almost daily is it's a very unequal battle and not in your favor. Mm. Um, you know, a, a, a friend of mine was having problems with squirrels eating his bird seed. And he, he went to the hardware store and he tried to buy a squirrel proof bird feeder. And the, the guy in the hardware store said it doesn't exist. <laughs> My friend was getting a little frustrated with this. And he said, you know, there's got to be a way to stop the squirrels. The guy from the hardware store said, sir, how much time each week do you spend thinking about the squirrels eating your bird seed? And my friend said, I don't know, 15, 20 minutes probably. Right, it's a few minutes. Guy from the hardware store said, sir, I want you to think about this from the squirrel's perspective. Whether the squirrel survives this winter depends on how successful he is at stealing your bird seed. So probably he wants to steal that bird seed even more than he wants to have sex with Mrs. Squirrel. Yeah. Who do you think is going to win here? Yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. And I'll say the same thing about the embezzler. They, they have a couple of advantages. They have far more time to devote to this problem than the doctor does to defending against it. Yeah, that's true. And secondly, I, I, I describe this sometimes as it's kind of like a poker game where you and I are playing poker, but your cards are face up and mine are face down. In other words, I know exactly what your defenses are. In fact, I'm probably a big component of those defenses. Yeah, I might have been the person to help you implement those defenses. You no, know, I'm, I'm the person who does day in balancing, for example. Yeah. And... You know, if, if you're not supervising me or if, if there's, a, there's a flaw in the system, which is really common, then I'm fully aware of that flaw. So, yeah. like I say, it's, it's, it's like I can see your cards and you can't see mine and let's, let's play poker. Um, wow. You know, and, and uh, it's, it's a very unequal battle. How, um, speaking of uh, unequal battles there, I'm going to guess that the majority of people – that you catch, you just like, it's, it's almost surprising. Like they're the sweetest people. They're the nicest people. They're the people who, I remember years ago, I read a book from Dr. Phil and he was talking about uh, baiters, cheaters, and liars. And he was talking about how one of his very first, uh, I guess, receptionist or secretaries, uh, he found out was, was stealing from her. And it was like this super nice grandma, like everybody's best friend lady and stole, I want to say it was like $60,000 from him or something like that. And that was his first lesson in learning that to see some of the signs of what is just not normal that you might want to look for when you're talking to people. But I would bet that you would see a lot of that. And, and gosh, it's got to be heartbreaking too. It can be. I mean, embezzlers come in, in, in two flavors. Okay. And the first group I call the serial embezzlers. So these are people who steal in one place and they get caught and they get fired. And then, you know, two weeks later, they're working across the street and doing it again. Just like their first experience. Yeah. 
and and these folks tend to be sociopathic. They tend to show some narcissistic tendencies, um, you know, and they're they're kind of habitual criminals who have just realized that that dentists are easy marks, right? Um, so that's one group, and and you know they do not at all resemble uh, the thief that you're talking about. I mean, you know, these are not people who are grandmotherly. They're 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 pretty calculated. And then you have the second group, and this person could be working in the office for five years, or they could be working there for 15 years, but they wake up one morning and they decide that stealing is the right thing to do. And probably when you hired them, they had no plan to steal. You know, this idea has come along later and lots of reasons for it. I, I, the, the motivation for stealing is typically either need or greed. Need mm -hmm. means, you know, my husband just lost his job and we're, we were already a month behind in the mortgage payment. We're going to lose our house unless I do something. Um, greedy thieves are, are stealing to address an ego deficit as opposed to a hole in their wallet. And they just, they just feel underappreciated and, and, and they're stealing to take what they think they should be paid. We were uh, talking about that a little bit before the show about this idea of, you know, I'm just not being appreciated enough. So it, it's fair because I can see my value that they're not able to see. So therefore I'm just, I'm, I'm equaling things up. Exactly. I'm, I'm taking what I, sh what I should be paid anyway. Um, so those are the reasons that people will steal. Um, I have this uh, thing that I do where I talk about, when you, when you say to somebody, well, you don't understand, do you know, like, you don't understand, David, I've done this, that you create this, this huge ego, right? You're totally at the height of ego yeah. because you're, you're literally talking about how no one on this planet before you were born or after has ever had your specific problem and overcome it without that excuse, right? And I could see where there are team members, look, I'm looking, I'm th literally thinking in my head now of some of the offices that I've been in and some of the team members who've come to me with that attitude of, yeah. you don't understand. I've done this and I've done that and I've deserved this. I, I recently had one where um, I got an email sent to me from an office manager who was complaining that she needed a raise because of all this work she was doing extra three times the work she was doing before. And yet the doctor is complaining about COVID and that they've lost $300,000 over the last two months. And yet she just went and bought a boat and she's remodeling her house. And so she's building this case around the fact that the doctor has this money and she's being yeah. stingy with it. Yeah. You know, and when you think about the characteristics of, dentistry as opposed to other businesses. You have people working in pretty close proximity, sometimes with some fairly big economic discrepancies. Yeah. Um, and those discrepancies, you know, there's, there's the real discrepancy, you know, and then there's the perceived discrepancy. In other words, most staff um, considerably overestimate how much the doctor takes home. Right. So, you know, if, 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 if I work, if I'm your office manager, and, you know, let's say that you're a clinically focused guy, you know, and that your, your, your great joy is doing that crown with the perfect margins. Um, the way I tend to view the world is that the only reason that Dino is successful is because I keep his chair full. And right. then when people leave it, I collect the money. Uh, and left to his own devices, he would probably starve to death because he would do great dentistry and no one would pay him for it. So, you know, I think that's worth something. Now, Dr. Dino Watt's perspective is, well, you know, you're an office manager and you're a pretty good one, but, you know, there are 10 other people who could take your place. And, you know, I don't know that that merits you and, you and me becoming business partners. Um, so, you know, there can, there can easily be a, a, a scenario that this person constructs where they think they're worth far more to the practice than the doctor does. Yes, of course. And, you know, I, I look at you and I think that, you know, we're, we, we sort of make equal contribution in this exercise of, of making Dr. Watt wealthy. Right. And, um, you know, that, that makes it easy for me to construct a situation where I think it's okay to steal. So 
uh, how much have you seen, like, I think our world today has really gone, that messaging is very prevalent in our news and in our world today of, as the worker, if you want to call the worker B in the office or in the company, you're equal to the risk, the, all the stuff that the doc, the, the knowledge that the doctor has, because you are facilitating that. Yeah. Has, have things gotten in more emboldened nowadays in the, in the world of uh, embezzlement in the world of have that feeling of entitlement that you've found? I, I think they have. Um, you know, I think there was a time when, um, you know, the, 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 the sort of social gap, I'll call it, between doctors and team mm -hmm. was a lot more pronounced than it is now. I mean, I see, I see, for example, a lot of offices where, you know, not in front of patients perhaps, but in private, you know, everybody's on a first name basis. Right. And I don't think 40 years ago that was ever the case. Sure. Um, you know, and the danger to you as my employer happens when I start to view us as equal. And, uh, you know, in, in that view, Dino, you know, I forget some things. I mean, I forget how much time you spend in school. I forget the amount of debt that you came out of school with and all those things. Right. You know, and, I, and, and I mean, and, and, and the business risk that you carry, which we're, we're uh, recording this right, at, r right during the COVID time. And, sure. you know, a lot, of, a lot of dentists who are still paying their staff are going without themselves. Mm -hmm. because the cash flow just isn't there. So, you know, the, the, the business risk certainly does not fall uniformly on, on doctor and team. Yeah. But the team members tend to either be unaware or forget those things. And to them, it's just, you know, it's Dino and David and, you know, you're taking home millions each year and I'm getting my $50,000 salary. Right. And that seems unfair. And at one point, the justifications for why you need it, deserve it, should have it, all that they trump that logic behind that you know we've all learned since we were three years old on the playground that you don't take other people's things i mean that's yeah. that's very ingrained in all of us yeah uh, from an early age and and you know unless you had truly horrible parents i'm sure that was their message um what thieves need is an ability to rationalize and to say to themselves you know i know that in general stealing is wrong but it's okay in this case because. Again, it goes back to that. You don't understand. It's, it's okay. You don't understand. I get it. And, and like you said, they have that, like, that delineation in their brain of one side. It's like, yes, of course, thieving is wrong and stealing is wrong. Yeah. But in this case, there's a total justified reason for it. I mean, one so of the classic rationalizations that we see is somebody who says, you know, they will plan to pay it back. So, oh. you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going through a difficult time right now and I'm taking this money. But of course, when my ship comes in, I like will pay loan. it back. Now, like, eventually, like you know, as embezzlement loan. goes on and as the dollars climb, they, at, at some point they lose that. But that's often an initial rationalization that people use. Okay, uh, so I want to know, uh, number one, well, let's go to that first. What can doctors really kind of start looking for that might be signs of red flags? Um, there are a lot of behavioral red flags when, when thieves steal, and there's a lot of research behind that, some of, some of which is specific to dentistry and some of which is more broadly based. But when thieves steal, there are a lot of behavioral markers. And almost every dentist who realizes that he or she is a victim, when they start looking back, will do a bit of this uh, and say, you know, the, 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 the indicators were there and I, I, I just didn't notice them or I didn't uh, equate their, them with embezzlement. But I'll give you some examples. Um, one, that's, one, that, one that comes out over and over again, both in our, in our case files and in the, in the broader context, is territoriality. Um, okay. Thieves tend to be possessive about their duties. And most of the time, it will even extend to their workspace. You know, this is the person who will get upset if somebody else sits down at their computer and starts using it. All right. Um, and the cousin of territoriality is that they don't want to cross train anybody to do any part of their job. I was literally just going to ask you that because I have okay. this thought in my head of someone that I'm like, They've been doing this for 30 years. They don't want to tell anybody. And in the, the, the office, they even, it's a small office, but they even have a thing of like, 
uh, hit by a bus scenario where right. they all agree that if this person were to be hit by a bus tomorrow, they would have no idea what to do with the financials and the business, even the owner. Yeah, that's, 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 wow. I'm, I'm not saying that person is stealing, but no, right, that would right. be very consistent with embezzlement. Um, depending on the theft pattern, a thief may be very reluctant to take vacation. Oh. Um, because some, some patterns of stealing require the thief to control the flow of information through the practice. So, so do they yes. like, do they kind of make that an altruistic thing of like, no, 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 I don't need vacation. I yep. care more about being here and you guys go, I'll be fine. <sighs> when, when you said a minute ago that a lot of dentists, you know, are, are, when they find out who the embezzler is and what's been going on, you know, the first thought is, well, you know, I always thought that person would take a bullet for me. Oh, wow. And my answer was, yeah, only if they could sell it. <laughs> um, That's yeah, true. it's, you know, superficially working for you and working against you look very similar. Um, and along the same lines, um, a lot of thieves will try to get alone time in the practice. So a lot of the stealing they do, they want to do by themselves. And partly it's because they don't want to be observed or, or kind of questioned on what they're doing. And partly it's because it takes concentration and it's hard to muster that amount of concentration when, you know, the doctor's flying through the office and patients are coming and going and whatever. So these are the people who will come in early or they'll hang around after everybody else has gone home or they'll make a visit to the practice on Saturdays. And often this is misinterpreted by the doctor as, you know, this person is as loyal as a puppy dog. They're giving me more time. They're not even making me, you know, have them clock in. They're doing amazing stuff. Wow. Yeah, yeah exactly. So um, those, are, those are some of the symptoms. Um, I'll, I'll give you a couple other ones that are a little more subtle. Okay. Um, one is what I call the conspicuous display of honesty. Um, when you think about how honest people think, they tend to just take it as a given that everybody perceives that they're honest and they don't really feel a need to draw people's attention to that. Um, writing, I'm writing notes as you're talking because I, I actually have okay. a scenario around that. Okay, great. When, when, when somebody makes a point of highlighting that they're being honest, what that tells you is that their honesty is a little bit selective. Right. Okay, like I'm going to switch it on now. Um, so, you know, watch for that one. So and I have this, I, I, before you get to the next one, I, the reason why I find that fascinating is because I have this joke, even in my home, I used to tell with my kids, like, if you have to tell people who you are, then you're not displaying it. Right. And, uh, I remember years ago watching some terrible afternoon television show, like a Murray Povich or something like that. And this girl was on stage and she's like, I am a classy woman. And I was like, man, if you have to tell people you're a classy woman, you're not a classy woman, right? It's the same yeah. type of thing, you know? And I get this with speakers when I'm on stage and I really try to catch myself with it, even using that on stage of being like, okay, so honestly, you really want this? Like, well, what'd you say all the last half an hour if now all of a sudden you're honest with me? Yeah. So it's this idea of displaying this, look how honest I was. I could have done this, but I didn't. Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. That's, that, that's it. And um, yeah, I, I was involved in a deposition a little while ago where a suspect was being questioned. Mm -hmm. And in the course of the deposition, which went on for a couple of hours, she said the words, I swear to God, probably a dozen times. <sighs> and whatever came out of her mouth right after she said, I swear to God, was an immense lie every single time. If you are really religious, in any mm -hmm. religion I can think of, honesty is just... It is what you do of you. Yeah. It, it's expected. Yep. Uh, and you certainly wouldn't invoke the deity's name to demonstrate that you're being honest. Right. Um, so it, it yeah, screams that, up almost desperation, right? When people are like, no, 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 I swear to God, I'm not going to do this. I talk about with core values in offices, right? That if, when I ask people, what are your core values? And they'll be like, uh, honesty and integrity and customer service. I'm like, no, no, no that's the cost of doing business. That's not a core value. Like that doesn't separate you from anything. That's a given. So the same type of idea. Mm -hmm. I love that. Okay. You said there was another one too. So. Um, yeah. Um, these are people who will cut ethical corners 
And, um, you know, a lot of times the patients will see this person as the fixer, like the one who can get insurance to cover stuff that nobody else can seem to. Right. Um, you know, let's say you and I are walking down the street and 50 feet in front of us, somebody's wallet falls out of their pants. Uh-huh. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to bend down, pick up the wallet and chase them and hand it back and say, here, you drop something. Right. The thief may do that too, but their thought process is a little bit different. A couple of things go through their mind before they hand back the wallet. Like, I wonder if anybody else saw this wallet fall. I wonder how much money is in the wallet. Mm. The overt manifestation may be exactly the same, but they get there via a different process. Wow. That's fascinating. Man, I love that. So that's one, two, three, four, five, six simple things people can really start looking at today when they get back in their office or tomorrow just to start paying notice. I, now, I mean, I don't know. Maybe there's not. I was just going to say, so where do you get to that place of where you're being a little paranoid about stuff versus paying attention to stuff? Is there a line or maybe you should be a little on the paranoid side versus the, oh, everybody's going to be perfect. Well, let's, let's differentiate between what you observe and what you do with that information. Okay. Um, I think my message is it's, it's important as a dentist to be aware of staff behavior, mm-hmm. especially stuff that is consistent with embezzlement. And it's also important to have some understanding of the circumstances of your staff. I mean, who in your staff has money problems? Um, oh, money smart. problems do not mean that somebody is stealing. Right. Um, but they mean that that person is in a precarious position and they may decide that the solution is to steal. Um, one thing I say sometimes that, that surprises a lot of people is that female dentists in general tend to be better at spotting embezzlement in their practices than male dentists. How interesting. Um, you know, it's, it's tempting to attribute this to female intuition, which is, you know, some, some ephemeral concept. And uh, I'm, I'm not discounting it at all, but I think it's more basic than that. When I look at how lunch happens in dental practices, if the dentist is male and the staff are female, it tends to happen a little bit differently than if the dentist is female. If it's a male dentist, typically the male dentist takes their lunch and they go in their private office and they close the door. Right. And, you know, they, they go on their computer and they catch up on the news or whatever. Right. Um, if it's a female dentist and that dentist doesn't eat lunch with the staff, you know, immediately they get labeled as stuck up. So yeah, totally. they, they, they tend to spend more lunch time with staff than the male dentists do, which means that they're immersed in the conversation and they, you know, they get to understand who's, you know, who's, who's, marriage is on shaky ground and who's uh, struggling financially and things like that a lot quicker than, than some of their male colleagues do. And I, I understand, you know, that I'm, you know, I'm generalizing very broadly and that there are, sure. I'm sure, exceptions on both sides. Absolutely. But, you know, one of the things I'd say is it's, it, you know, there's, there's a line that should not be crossed between being boss and being friend. And, and that's, you know, that's the case regardless of your gender and everything else. Yeah. Um, but, one suggestion I'd make to dentists of, of uh, any chromosomal set is that you need to understand what makes your staff tick and what their challenges are in life so that you're aware of who's vulnerable. Yeah, that's a, it's a really good uh, exercise in just paying attention. I, as you were saying that, I was thinking, yeah, because usually you're from, uh, well, I won't say usually, oftentimes the uh, office manager is the one to kind of report back to the doctor, hey, this is what's going on in this person's life because they're in the know and they're in the mix. But if they're also the person controlling that information, that can be a challenge as well. Yeah. How do, do you see, I don't know, is there a pattern of the embezzlement happening more with people who are in the more upper, if you would, management of the company versus the lower or is it kind of equal across the board? Um, certainly the office manager has the most opportunity. Okay. Um, so yeah, the, the higher up the food chain, um, the more accessible embezzlement is. So if, if, if I'm the office manager and if in the doctor's mind, I run the business 
end of the practice and he or she runs the clinical end, then I'm probably not really supervised in a lot of what I do. And that, that gives me a, a, a beautiful opportunity to steal. Mm -hmm. If I'm a receptionist and my boss is the office manager, um, and I want to steal. Now I have to fool somebody who is, is right. supervising me as opposed to someone who's not. So that's more right. challenging. Sure. Um, but, you know, we, we see theft that happens by a, a lot of different people in the practice. But, you know, certainly the biggest dollar thefts and the ones that are perpetuated for the longest time tend to be the office manager. What's the silliest ones that you've seen? Like what, when you're just like, man, this wasn't even necessary. And yet you did like you're caught. <laughs> well, there, there was the woman who was stealing from a practice and then she won $3 million in the state lottery. What? Yeah. And, you know, if, if most staff won $3 million, they would um, quit, the, quit the practice the next yeah. day and, you know, say something, say whatever they'd never dared say before to the doctor. Right. Um, th this woman didn't do that. She kept working. And interestingly, the amount of money that she was stealing each month after she won the lottery went up. Really? So she was stealing more as a millionaire than she was before. Kind of got a little emboldened around it. Well, I, I think she was getting some kind of dopamine rush from stealing, right. you know, the way you might from bungee jumping. Right. And she was addicted. You know, thieves, some thieves get a, get a rush from it. And she wanted that. Um, in, in terms of bizarre, uh, one, one of the weirdest ones I saw was um, I got a call from an orthodontist and he said, I, I practice with another doctor and the two of us have this arrangement where when patients pay in cash, we just put it in our pockets and we don't tell the IRS. <laughs> okay. Um. Um, but uh, <laughs> the reason I'm calling you, David, is that I think my partner's stealing more than I am. No. He's mad because he's stealing more than I am. <laughs> yeah, well, and, and this guy was right. Um, his, his partner was, in fact, kind of abusing this little system that they had between themselves. I can tell you that was one of the most artistic reports we ever wrote because we had to dance around this elephant yeah. in the room called tax evasion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, one, one of my most senior investigators took that one on and she, she did a, a, a masterful job and uh, communicating what was happening without, without spelling out the damaging part. Wow. Wow. That's funny. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we talked a little bit before the show. I want to dive into this kind of quickly. I know we're running a little bit out of time, but um, the screening process to bringing people on is probably one of the best ways to avoid a lot of this, right? To be able to know who you're hiring, the right background checks, and you mentioned a few things that I know, I know that these guys are not doing, guys and gals are not doing when it comes to hiring people, especially right now, here we are, COVID, we've got, you know, people who are willing to come back, people who are not willing to come back. Maybe we're trying to shift the chairs at the table a little bit, and we're trying to get some new blood in there and hire new people. And so we're just putting them in there. Forget COVID. There are times where we're just stressed because, you know, two people suddenly quit or two people needed to be fired or whatever happened. And now we got to fill those spots. And so we find the best fit for the job as we think. So where are these mistakes in the filtering process of hiring that can save them a ton of headache later, even though it's hard work or more work up front? You know, dentistry has allowed itself to get out of step with how the rest of the world hires. Mm. Um, I cannot get a job with FedEx delivering the junk people buy from Amazon without a drug test. And yet yeah. I could work in virtually any dental practice in the United States. Do you know that makes no sense? Yeah. Um, you know, but, but dentists are generally altruists. They normally see the best in people. And... Um, you know, hiring can be a very immersive process. I mean, you have this picture in mind of the right employee for the job and, you know, it's, it, you get 30 resumes and from those 30 resumes, you've got to get down to the three or four that you want to interview and then pick the one that you hire. That's challenging. Yep. 
Um, it's also challenging because most dentists really have no training in this, no, you know, not much background, and hopefully it's something they don't have to do very often. Yeah. So it's already a difficult process. And then really what I'm encouraging them to do is to overlay another layer on top of this, which is, okay, so what if they're not telling me everything? Or what if what they are telling me isn't true? Um, and the, the idea of the hiring process is to learn as much as you can about people and then make a decision, not make the decision and just hope for the best, which frankly is the way that most dentists really do this. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and yeah, I mean, the turnaround is, can be crazy sometimes in yeah, these offices. It, it can, but let's, let's talk about some things that typically aren't done. And, I'm, and I mentioned the drug test right off the bat. And absolutely. we talked about this before we went on the air. If I have a drug problem, the best place I can imagine to work is a dental practice because prescription medication um, originates there. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and uh, a lot of states have prescription monitoring programs and stuff, but most of the safeguards are really designed to stop external people from the practice from abusing the system. In other words, if, you know, if somebody gets an abscess in their tooth and they go to 12 different dental offices and, and pick up narcotics prescriptions for each, that's what the prescription monitoring programs will capture. They're not really built in such a way that they will stop people internal to the practice from Got abusing it. the system. Um, and, and so that's, that's the basic problem. Another thing that dentists almost universally fail to do is a criminal records check. And I'm going to give you a statistic that should frighten every dentist. 65 million Americans. So that's one in four adults has a criminal record. Wow. Now, let's be clear. Not every criminal record should stop somebody from getting a job in a dental practice. You know, sure. if, I'm, if I'm 45 years old and I had a conviction for marijuana possession in California 25 years ago, where marijuana is now legal. Right. Um, Maybe I was guilty of a little bit of bad judgment in, as a 20-year-old, but um, most of us were guilty of that in one way or another. Totally. And that wouldn't stop me from hiring somebody. On the other hand, uh, you know, a conviction for check fraud two years ago certainly would. Um, yeah. So criminal records check is a must. The big one, though, the big thing, and a lot of dentists fall down here, is I need to speak to somebody's former employers. You know, I, I, I talk to dentists about this idea of uh, what I sometimes call forensic hiring. And the, the first thing a lot of them will say to me is, well, I always check references. And I said, I, what I usually say to them is, you know, that word references itself tells me that you're doing the wrong thing. I do not give a flying donut what somebody's eighth grade science teacher thinks of them. <laughs> right. Okay. The only people I want to talk to are former employers. And my rule is really simple. I want to hear from everybody they've worked for in the last five years at least. Um, now, when you do this, a couple of considerations. The first one is do not ever phone any phone number that an applicant gives you. If somebody says they worked for Dr. Tom Johnson in Peoria, Illinois, Google is really cheap to use. Yes. You know, get on, use your fingers find the phone number for Dr. Johnson's office, call that number, and then you know you're speaking with the right person. Yeah. If you phone the number the applicant gives you, you may end up talking to their uncle who pretends to be Dr. Johnson. For sure. Um, and equally, written reference letters have no value. You know, back in the days when I broke the rules, forgers were, were pretty smart criminals. You know, they were kind of the prosthodontists of, of, of criminals. Right. Um, but... Now, you know, if, I mean, schools have problems with, with high school sophomores forging report cards that they give to their parents. Sure. Uh, so forgery is, is a, a, a pretty simple task now, whereas it used to be pretty, uh, pretty high in criminal activity. Can I ask you about the uh, contacting former employers? Because I... I've mentioned this often to uh, maybe not five years back, but even just going to the last former employer. And I have actually gotten pushback from some of my clients about this because their, their feeling is, well, we really can't ask anything other than did they show up on time and, you know, 
whatever? Would you hire them back again? I don't know. What are some of the questions you suggest they ask when they do contact with former employers that can give them a clue without being illegal? Um, first of all, it's not illegal to ask anything as long as it's not discriminatory. Okay. Uh, so you can't, for example, ask the age of this person uh, outside of a certain bracket because you are not permitted to discriminate based on age, for example, over 40. Mm -hmm. um, so you can ask anything you want. Uh, the, the real problem is, is more that a lot of former employers are a bit reluctant to talk about their employees if things didn't go well. Um, in my mind, there are three questions that need to be asked. And if you get more information than this, great. But these three will probably tell you all you need to know. Okay. The first question is, what was their start date and what was their end date? And what you need to do with that information is compare it to the resume that they gave you because one of the big dangers when you're hiring is there's a job that's left off the resume. And one of the ways people cover that is they stretch dates of other jobs to make so that there's not a hole in the resume. Okay. So I want to confirm the dates of employment and, and don't prompt the former employer. Just ask them the open-ended question. What was their start date? What was their end date? That's interesting. Okay. The second question I want to ask is what was their job title when they left? Because what a lot of people will do is give themselves the upgrade to first class. In other words, I was a receptionist at my last job and I'm applying at yours for an office manager position. What am I going to claim my last title was? Right. Okay. Now, maybe I was a receptionist at a solo practice and I was doing accounts payable and I was doing payroll and I was doing some of the functions that would normally belong to an office manager. But if that's the case, I shouldn't just be pretending that the doctor had bestowed that title on me. I should say to you, Dr. Watt, um, in my last job, I was receptionist. But if you look at my list of duties on my resume, you can right, see that that's really, I, okay, yeah. that's the way you'd present that with integrity and sure. not just pretend like I was the office manager. Yeah. So I mean, I want to, there's a lot of people that can claim that they were the office manager or whatever because of what they feel was entitled to them. Again, going back to that, what yeah. I deserve versus, you know. Yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a chance to catch somebody in a little act of dishonesty mm -hmm. that, as you say, uh, really reflects a, you know, a, a, a feeling of entitlement. Yeah. And the third question I want you to ask is very basic. Would you rehire this person? And the beautiful thing about that question is that anything other than yes, of course, in a minute means no. So I ask you that question and I get three seconds of silence. You've answered it. Yeah. Or some, well, I mean, I guess if. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, the, if, if the, the answer to that question that's going to impress me the most is, you know, in, in a heartbeat. In fact, I didn't know they were looking for work. I'm going to call them and try and get them back. Yeah. Um, you know, that's, that's the one that says to me, okay, this was a good employee. There um, was a, a speaker once who was quoting someone else and he said, if you, a great litmus test for your team is to look at your team members and think, if this person went to go work for my competition, would I be worried? And if not, then you need to let them go, right? right? And in the same vein of, yeah, if this person isn't saying, man, I wish they'd come back. I wish they'd move back here. I w I've tried to get them to stay, you know, that that's true. Any hesitation is a no. And, and, and anybody who's asked that question about a good employee is, gonna, is, is not going to have a problem saying yes. It's again, when, when somebody either says not in 100 million years or, you know, uh, well, you know, e either of those really says the same thing. Yeah. So, so those, are, those are the only questions that you really need answered. I mean, sure, if you can confirm salary, that's great. Um, if you can get some uh, less structured information, from the former employer, that's great too. But that's you know, most, most times if you have those three, it's either, it's either going to reinforce your decision to hire or, or, or suggest not to. Um, at, at what point in the process do you, would you suggest they do that? Up front or? Um, what I tell doctors generally is this. Um, picture a funnel. Mm -hmm. And you start with, with 30 resumes at the big end of the funnel. And at the end, you get down to one chosen candidate. Sure. Once you get to that chosen candidate, that's the time that you start doing the drug test. And 
um, phoning sure. former employers and doing all of those things. There is no point whatsoever in using, in, in playing what I call um, interview survivor, where, you know, you say to yourself, okay, I'm just not smart enough to pick the best candidate out of these five. So, you know, we'll, we'll eliminate two of them because they have drugs in their bloodstream and we'll eliminate another one because sure. uh, their, their former employer didn't have good things to say about them. When you do that, you make this process into a lot more work than it really needs to be. Absolutely. So get down to your one and then make sure that they are who they say they are. Okay. So then does that bring in maybe something, I'm wondering if you see this, the, the lazy factor at that point, right? Here we've gotten to the end of that funnel. We've got this one person who we think on paper, they look good. They're personable. They're, man, they just seem like a right fit. Man, I, I'll just skip all the other. Look, I, I'm going to go with my gut on this instead of actually doing what's told, like what you just yeah. suggested okay. and, and it becomes and lazy. If- if, if you're that dentist, just unplug your x-ray machine because by that logic, you shouldn't need that either. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> right? Just, you know, save, save yourself the time and the hassle of, of taking all those films and having to read them and stuff. I mean, just, just go with your gut. Go with your gut. Uh, you know, the reason that, that, that imaging exists is the same as this because our gut isn't all, you know, our, our guts are fallible. And, you know, we, we replace them with science. That's a great point. That really is like the hiring x-ray, right? Yeah. Like this, this is yeah. your hiring x-ray. These three questions, these three areas, and then everything else is, is a bonus. So, I mean, I know very few dentists who are going to open up a tooth and do a crown prep without an x-ray or very few orthodontists who are interested in moving teeth around without, without a CEF. Even if the patient's like, no, 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 I'm fine. I brush every day. I floss every day. No, no, no. I haven't felt any cracks. No, no, no. Like even if, yeah, you're right. Yeah. Wow, that's great. Holy moly, Dave, I can't believe this hour has gone by so fast. It's like, the, the, and this is what's so necessary, right? This is the reason why I wanted to have you on the show is because I know there's, there's things, I mean, like I said, I've written, I've got two pages of notes here of things that just people need to be looking out for, people need to be aware of. And it's not a, a feel good, pleasant conversation all the time. But in order to save your business, in order to really serve at a higher level, you have to be thinking about this. You have to be really be uh, on the watch for this. And sadly, I know that there are some people out there who are already through this conversation alone. We're probably thinking of it beforehand, but now are kind of seeing maybe a few red flags inside of their office right now and seeing some areas where they don't want to address it because there always comes that thing, right? Of like, but they're such a good person deep down. I always say this when it comes to hiring or firing people too, is you know, it always comes back to like, but they're such a nice person because mine's a, a lot less invasive when I talk about why are you allowing that insubordination? Why are you okay with this person, you know, breaking those rules? It's like, well, but deep down, they're a good worker. People really like them. If I let them go, there are so many other people in this community that like them and that might hurt my business, right? They think of all those things and I get it. I totally understand. But when it comes down to it here in this, at this level with the embezzlement, with your business, it's about survival of not just your business, but being able to pay everybody else's paycheck. They're stealing from not just you, they're stealing from everybody else in that office. They're stealing from clients. So Mm -hmm. it's so important for you to really think about this. Your book is called Dental Embezzlement, The Art of Theft and the Science of Control, right? Yes, it is. And that's available on Amazon? It sure is. Okay. I want everyone listening to this to go and get that book. Is it on Audible as well, or is it just a uh, uh, text? Um, no, it's, it's available on Kindle. Um, on Kindle. Oh, great. There's, Perfect. Yeah. There's no, uh, paper, you can get the paperback or the Kindle edition. There's no, there's no Audible book yet. Okay. So that is something that I was just everybody run out and get just to get a good idea, a good uh, understanding of what you should be looking for. I know we're able to cover a few things here, but in that book, you're going to go dive a lot deeper and get some more information about that. So we've come to a place in our show, David, where first of all, I just want to thank you so much for being here and sharing this information with us. We've come to this place where we actually do six questions with everyone that are kind of rapid fire right off the top of your head. Are you willing to play? Let's do it. All right. So the first question is, what is the most expensive thing that private practice owners are missing in their practice? Common sense. (laughs) 
I, you know, I, that is a really great answer because I'm sitting here looking at some of these. And like you said, it's that hand, you know, palm on the forehead type moment right after the fact. Some yeah. of the stuff that you're talking about is like, well, duh, why wouldn't you do that? Like, and yeah. yet I know we're all in the middle of life and life is happening all around us. And we've got COVID and we've got all these other things going on. So common sense, it's a great question, a great, great, great response. Uh, what's a book that you believe every private practice owner should be reading? Um, wow, I, uh, I, I, I like a lot of books. I, I think uh, Fred, Fred Joyle's book, uh, um, Everything is Marketing. Oh, great. Is, is one that I um, highly recommend. Um, and, and understand that I'm, I'm kind of the prophet of doom and gloom in dentistry. Um, I, I do love um, some, some things on the other side. And uh, my, my good friend, Dr. Alan Stern, has mm -hmm. a great book called Enjoy the Ride. And okay. Alan's kind of the opposite of me. I mean, he's, he's very much the glass half full kind of guy. And well, it would make sense you have somebody like that in your life because you yeah. see this crap every day. Like you're dealing with this. I'm sure it's not something you wake up every day going, boy, I'm so glad I get to like make catch. Well, I guess you are probably glad. Actually, I do. That, oh, yeah, you are probably yeah. glad you get to no, catch. I, 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 I wake up in the morning and I say, yeah, I, I get to. I get to I can, I can understand, you know, just like how people talk about with dentists, how like they cause pain on a daily basis. People don't want to go see them. And that's really a high stress situation. You know, it would be nice. It would be wonderful if everybody could be trusted. Nobody was going to steal and you were out of a job in some ways. It would be nice. Well, I mean, my perspective on this might be a little different, but I understand it, where you're coming it, from. Yeah. It's like the Michael J. Fox thing, right? About how like his job is to, his goal is to close down his, uh, his uh, charitable, uh, 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 what's it called? His organization, right? The Fox out, out Fox about Parkinson, right? If we eradicate Parkinson's disease and he's out of a job and that's what his, jo his goal is. My point is that obviously that's not going to happen, but it makes sense that you have somebody like your friend in your life because you're, you got to have that balance of that joy in your life too. And living on that side. So I love it. I think it's great. Yeah, Alan's a, you know, it's a great upbeat kind of message. Alan's a 67 year old dentist in New Jersey who loves his work and, you know, has, plans, plans on doing this for many years. And, and, and he's also one of the fittest guys I know. Nice. And, um, yeah, it's a, it's a good positive message. And if anybody's kind of feeling the weight of the world these days, uh, Alan's book is, uh, is, is a good place to go. Thank you for sharing that. Well, speaking of books in my book, The Practice Rx, I focus on team culture and team performance as the foundation of, for business growth. What do you see as the biggest challenge that private practice owners are facing with their teams and their culture? Well, COVID has certainly thrown the world for a loop right now. And, you know, I hear a lot of dentists complaining right now about staff who, you know, are, are fearful of coming back to work. And I certainly understand where they're coming from. I think also that the availability of government aid sort of changes how, how people, how much risk people are prepared to accept. Yeah, for sure. Uh, so, you know, that's a, that's a current short-term problem. Um, in the long term, I, I think a lot of dentists are going to have trouble finding the staff they want. Um, you know, this is, this has been going on for years. I mean, until COVID hit, the U S had record low unemployment. Yeah. And, so that was hard to find people. Yeah. You know, and, and, and one of the pushbacks I get sometimes when I say, you know, you need to do a little better job of screening people before you hire them is, well, I only get one applicant for the job. And right. if I don't, if I don't move quickly, they take something else. Right. Um, you know, so dentistry is always going to suffer from not being able to put the right people into the right positions. Yeah, so true. Okay, how can uh, people reach out to you, find you, connect with you? Um, they can uh, go on our website and, and once I tell them the name, they probably won't forget it. It's www.dentalembezzlement.com. Pretty straightforward. <laughs> yep. Um, we also have a toll free number, but they can, they can get that right on the website. So that's a good place to start. Uh, it, it, can they reach out just if they have a, uh, a an inkling, a thought, a maybe, a maybe, and like, what's the, what, what would be the trigger point for them to reach out to you? Um, yeah, we, we are 
happy to talk to people who say, this is what I'm seeing in my practice. David, what do you think? Um, we, we absolutely welcome those conversations. And, That's great. Um, you know, w- w- when I want to hear from you is the earliest moment you suspect. Mm-hmm. Um, because, you know, that's um, what happens when, you know, when people get into trouble and, and, and have big damage from embezzlement, you know, and we were talking earlier about those million dollar kind of thefts. Yeah. Um, that happens because people ignore their gut. Yeah. Uh, you and, know, and they, they, they suppress that, that feeling that they have that everything's not right. And here's what I want to happen out of this conversation is, look, if you're listening to this and anything that David has brought up, that even gives you that little bit of a tingle in the back of your neck, that little feeling of like, well, you know what? Now that I think about it, that does seem a little off. You don't need to become Sherlock Holmes. You don't need to go and do all the investigation. I think you first need to just reach out and, and get your feeling, that intuition, that idea, um, if you will, uh, confirmed or th- more ideas of what you can look for and go down that path a little more. That's why I would suggest you reach out to David if you have any ideas or any inkling whatsoever. Absolutely. So, uh, and we have some assessment tools that we can run people oh, through perfect. You know, that, that give a little more scientific um, validation or rejection of the, the possibility that somebody's stealing. Oh, I love that. That's perfect. That's great. So what's the best advice that you've ever received in life or business? Oh, wow. Um, hmm. uh, I'm, I'm drawing a blank on that one. And uh, it's, it's not often that somebody has me speechless. Um, <laughs> you know, I've, I've, I've been lucky enough to get a lot of good advice from people. I mean, what, what one person said to me a long time ago is that um, people buy from emotion, not from reason. Yeah. And that's true whether we're talking about me investigating for embezzlement or a doctor talking to a patient about a crown. Yeah. Connect with people emotionally first and then they'll back it up with logic. Absolutely. Okay. So last question is what's the best resource or tool that every private practice owner should be using to grow their practice right now? Um, They have to communicate with patients properly. Um, Um, you know, I, I, I learned something from a friend of mine years ago. This was, a, um, this was a guy who was in very senior management at a tech company. He was probably making a million dollars a year. And he was newly divorced and he and I went, uh, went out to a bar one night. And um, when we got there, there was a friend of mine who's a female periodontist of about his age. And I introduced the two of them. And they talked for a few minutes. And finally, my friend, whose name was Gary, Gary ended up having to use the restroom. Um, and and he, he was pretty much out of sight when the periodontist turned to me and she said, nice looking guy, but he's really got to do something about that bridge. He had this fairly ugly anterior bridge. Mm-hmm. And I'd noticed it before, but I just, I just never said anything to Gary. And w- when, when she said that to me, I said, yeah, you're right. I'll talk to him. So I talked to my friend Gary a few days later and I said, Gary, do, do, you know, that bridge you have is probably functionally fine, but I don't know if you knew this, but uh, you know, that one's probably about 25 or 28 years old and they could do a much nicer, more natural bridge now. So Gary had no idea. Wow. And he said to me, well, okay, so, you know, who could do a good bridge for me? And I gave him a name and he went and he spent eight grand on a nice new bridge. And, you know, this is a newly divorced guy. So, He's, he's kind of, you know, he, he wants to look good. He mm-hmm. was thrilled. Um, what that exposed to me, you know, he'd been going to the same dentist for 15 years. Yeah. And that dentist had never said to him what I said, you know, Gary, that functionally that bridge is fine. Are you interested in hearing about options that would, that would be more aesthetically pleasing? And the dentist had to know that Gary was, you know, a fairly well-off guy. Mm-hmm. And he he's going through, probably knew he's gone through a divorce. Yeah. I mean, you know, this uh, paying $8,000 for the bridge didn't, didn't phase Gary in the slightest. Right. But this, but this guy, you know, this dentist must have noticed how ugly this thing was because it looked like four chiclets. Wow. Um, and, uh, you know, he, he must have noticed how ugly it was. And he just, you know, I think the doctor's assumption was if Gary wanted something done, he would ask for it. 
That's so true. And that's a and, terrible way to run a business, right? And, it's like and Gary's uh, assumption was, you know, here's a guy who knows a hell of a lot more yeah. about than I do. And I, you know, I, I she's sh- not saying anything. So yeah. Yeah. So, you know, between those two, the, the doctor lost a patient and a good bridge and everything else. So yeah. Yeah. one of the questions I'd encourage the audience members to ask their patients, you know, hand them a mirror and say, is there anything about your smile you don't like? It's great. And whatever comes out of their mouth next is going to make you money. Yeah. That's true. So Very that's true. have that's, that communication with them. You're right. It's you got nothing to do with what I do, but I just I just see but that it's feeling. A, well, well, David, one of the benefits that you and I have is because we're not in that chair because we're not running that business. Is we do see the little things like that. That and and I don't think it's a, a it's a critique or a fault. It's just a oh, matter. Well. of They're in their own space. Like I always say, you can't see in your own jar. Uh, Keith Cunningham has this saying, you can't smell your own breath or see your own golf swing, right? You need other people to see that. And here, you're, it's not your world, but it's your world, right? You see this and go like, you know, if you just did this, you just communicated a little bit more. If you ask that simple question of what is it about your smile you don't like, man, you're going to make more money. And uh, I think that's brilliant. So thank you so much for sharing everything that you did today. Uh, it's just a, a plethora of great information. So thank you very much. I appreciate you being here. It was a pleasure. Well, everybody, thank you again for being here on the Propreneur Podcast and listening to us and sharing uh, your time with us. We really do appreciate it. Again, thank you also for sharing this podcast and subscribing to it. Uh, we are creeping up on our 100th episode and we're very excited about that. And it's all because of you tuning in every single week to a new show. So thank you, everybody. Remember, our goal here is always to help you be more proactive, productive, and profitable in all areas of your life and business. We'll see you on the next episode. Thanks so much again for listening to the Propreneur Podcast. We really appreciate your support. If you haven't subscribed already, please make sure you do so. Also, if you feel like you might be a good fit for our podcast as a guest or know somebody who you think would be, go ahead and email us at dino at dinowatt.com. Again, thanks for support. We'll see you on the next episode.